We're going to shift gears a little bit now, as you can see, and I, as I mentioned earlier this morning, um, we're going to uh, have a panel discussion. I'd like to invite the, the, the panelists uh, to come up here and, and be seated. You know, the, the rationale for putting a panel discussion uh, at this point in time for the next hour or 50 minutes um, is really, A, uh, that um, we didn't think anybody uh, could sit through 15 or 20 presentations of international greatness, uh, no matter how great they are, for, the, for an entire day. And, um, and secondly, uh, we want to use this panel um, as a means to begin to project where we want to be tomorrow. Um, so we don't want to wait till tomorrow to come to our conclusions. We really want to um, begin the dialogue right now about where, where we might possibly want to be at the end of the day tomorrow. Um, and uh, I really want to engage the audience in this, too. Um, um, these are leaders uh, just like yourselves in uh, genomic medicine, um, and, uh, but they're going to make some statements, but uh, certainly we want to hear your opinions and reaction uh, to, to what they have to say. Uh, so what I've asked them to do in preparation for this is uh, each one of them will have a few minutes to both introduce themselves, uh, their stakeholder perspective, what that is, what do, they, what do they do for a living, what kinds of organizations are they <laughs> involved in, <laughs> um, um, and then to really begin to think about what, from their perspective, also synthesizing a little bit of what they've heard over the last several hours, would be the sweet spot of where an international group such as this could begin to move and advance the field. It's not meant to be the conclusive statement, but it's really meant to be the uh, building the foundational statements upon which we hope this meeting will um, will be will use this use this dialogue to uh, do something constructive by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, no particular order, but I'm happy to start um, with Irene who, Norstead, who's uh, to my right, and we'll just go across this way if that's okay with everybody. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. Um, so I come from the European Commission, and for those of you who do not know, the European Commission is the executive arm of the uh, European Union, which represents 28 countries and about 400 million citizens. Um, so what's important to state here is that healthcare is actually a national responsibility, so that is not the competency of the European Union. However, what we can do is that we support, of course, the development of an evolution of healthcare through our uh, European research program, and also the European Commission is the regulator for the market when it comes to therapies and, and diagnostics and uh, other aspects. Uh, so these are the points where I come from, and uh, we um, have over the last years uh, looked into personalized medicine. We've organized a number of workshops, conferences, and so we have sort of a research agenda that we have followed over the last years to try to address all the different aspects of personalized medicine from the basic omics generation all the way up to the uh, uptake in healthcare, including health technology assessments, methodologies, etc. because we believe that it's important for us as a research funder to uh, go across the whole innovation cycle and to make sure that we can create a pipeline for new products to come through and to reach the patients. Um, so our major tool for funding are uh, sort of multi-annual programs. They go over a seven-year basis, and this is where I think Europe differs from many other countries and regions, um, is that we actually have a stable research funding for a seven-year period, and our new period starts actually this year, 2014, where we will have about seven billion euros for research funding. And also what's kind of unique with what we do is that we fund um, sort of uh, research collaborations, not only between European partners, but also international partners. Uh, so our general philosophy is that we have three partners from European countries, our European member states. Um, and in addition, we can have associated countries, or they can be included, or we can have anybody from the rest of the world can participate in what we do. So we believe that uh, what we do could actually really stimulate and also bring together what we have discussed today in projects that we can fund. Um, we have also collaborated um, together with our colleagues um, in health and consumer protection, and we have recently published a report called The Use of Omics in Personalized Medicine where we start to go through 
a little bit a snapshot of where we are and all the different aspects uh, that concerns the development and implementation of personalized medicine. So we are looking at the different aspects from a research point of view, but also from the regulatory side um, and also from the uptake side. Uh, so I can give you the, um, the web link so you can download this report to have a look at that. There are currently a number of regulatory pieces which are under discussion by the European <coughs> Member States and the European Parliament that will be hugely important for the future of this area. One of them is concerns data protection and the other one concerns the um, regulation of in vitro diagnostic devices. Um, so coming back to that, um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, the first calls in our new program is already open and we have included a number of topics which I think can be very relevant for this grouping. One of them is, for example, that we will support piloting of rolling out personalized medicine into the healthcare and also looking at the economic um, aspects of that. Uh, the deadline for that particular topic will be in October, so there is still time to put together consortia. And as I said, we're open for participants from across the world. Um, another area that we have seen is really a value of death in this area is biomarker validation. And there we would like to do a major push um, into this area. Um, when we come to the key issues for global cooperation, I would also like to draw the attention to the number of already ongoing international corporations that we have, that we shouldn't sort of kick off something new um, in addition, but also to build on what we already have. We already have the International Cancer Genome Consortium, International Human Epigen e Epigenome Consortium, and in particular, International Rare Disease Research Consortia, which are already working, for example, on important issues such as standards, um, for sequencing, we also have work going on on ontologies, etc. And um, I hope that could be sort of put into the picture because from, from my perspective, I think very much um, of the cooperation as far as we see is very much how do we ensure that we can uh, jointly benefit from the work that we do so that we work on a very solid basis of the data that is generated, a standardization of pre-analytical procedures, of um, genetic testing, we have Eurogene test was already mentioned today, but also to, to look at that in more global context. Um, also standards electronic health records, of course interoperability of data sharing, etc. An area that we have looked a little bit on and we find hugely important is the use of statistics. Unfortunately, there are a lot of publications which are published which are not using appropriate statistical methods and <coughs> therefore their interpretations are actually not valid. Unfortunately, they may raise hopes in patients uh, that something new is in pipeline and when you go a bit further down the route of validating, actually it proved not to be true. Um, coming to that, I'm also coming back on standards again, again about standards, about validation of markers, I think is something which is very important that we start to look at at a global scale so we really know what we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I, before going on, I just wanted to ask you one clarifying question. You mentioned a number of consortia that are ongoing. Are any of them focused on implementation of genomics or are they more discovery of genomics? Do, are, there, are you aware of any that are actually focused on the implementation? Uh, the one that goes furthest, I would say, is the rare diseases. But it's not looking at the real implementation, but it's really paving the way for the implementation in, in healthcare as well, I would say. Otherwise, it's very much data generation, but we know that is the b important stepping stone. And unless the data generation is done in the correct way, it's going to be useless for the implementation as such. Hi, I'm Kevin Moses, and I think I provide what Jeff was suggesting should be relief from unrelieved uh, excellence in <laughs> genetic medicine. <laughs> My background is not in this field, so I'll do a very brief introduction to myself and then tell you something about the Wellcome Trust that I work for and then what, how we work in this field. So I myself was originally an old-fashioned geneticist, and then worked in molecular biology and development for about 25 years in the US coming through postdoc and uh, faculty positions and ultimately working for Hughes for a few years uh, helping to found Genelia Farm which is in neuroscience. But 
couple of years ago, I moved back to the UK, where I'm now Director of Science Funding at the Wellcome Trust. So the Wellcome Trust is a large charity. In the US view, it would be a foundation. It sits on an endowment that was left behind by a pharmaceutical company, Burroughs Wellcome, that about 20 years ago was unwound and became a, a more normally established foundation with an endowment that generates income that the trust spends. At this point, we spend roughly, in US terms, a billion dollars a year on grants, and about 20% of that goes to genetics and genomics. We fund mostly in the UK. We fund about 20% outside the UK in low and middle income countries, uh, with major centers in South Africa, in Kenya, in Malawi, in Thailand, and in Vietnam. Uh, we are focused all across biomedicine beyond genetics and genomics. In terms of genetics and genomics, the largest single investment we make is in the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, which sits at Pinkston. And I won't go into too much detail because I'll make Tim Hubbard giggle because I'm sure he knows much more about it than I do. Uh, also here with me sitting at the back is Michael Dunn, who is the head of our Department of Genetics and uh, Genomic Sciences. So the main, as I said, the largest investment we make is in the Sanger Institute. Uh, which is of the order of about $150 million a year, uh, playing with the exchange rate in my mind, in round numbers. But in addition, there's a, a Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics in Oxford, which is a smaller but very excellent operation based on originally statisticians and other people. There's also a number of individual grants to people such as Shankar <coughs> Balasubramanian, who was uh, instrumental in next-gen sequencing and others. So we have quite a long history in genomics and genetic technologies. And in addition, but the, the thing I should say overall is that we are primarily a research funder. We are not implementing healthcare. So our goal is to produce discoveries that lead to improvements in human and animal health, but we are not ourselves implementers. As I said, we have a fairly long history in genetics and genomics, a shorter history in healthcare records and essentially human phenotyping. And when we come to comments later in the discussion, perhaps, I mean, to my mind, this is the harder area of the topic of this meeting, is how the human phenotyping and the, med the health records are, can be brought to uh, standardization and the quality that then allows the bioinformatics to work into the sequence. So to me, that's the largest issue, I'm sure this is an obvious thought that has occurred to everybody else here before me. Um, that's what I have to say by way of introduction. So uh, I'm Victor Zhao. I'm uh, the Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke University, but also that CEO that you talked to, and in, in, in this case in the health system, uh, and I'm a champion of this area. As you can see, uh, Jeff is, I appointed Jeff as a the Director of Center for Personalized and Precision Medicine. Now, I'm a physician scientist. In fact, I worked in this field. Arvinda and I go back a long way. I see we had bright green pirates, many people I know in this room uh, in working in this area. But more recently, particularly looking at how to champion develop this area and more in the international arena. Within Duke, as you know, we have uh, uh, the Institute of uh, Genome Science and Policy, we have the Stepman Metabolic Center, we have Center for Genetic, uh, Human Genetic Variation of uh, David Goldstein and many others. But my involvement in this area, uh, working alongside with a number of people in this room, actually is beginning to think about the broader picture. And hopefully in this conversation, we'll have a chance to pursue this. So one is because uh, very interested with Jeff and I back when we were in Boston in the pre-competitive space. And this is probably clearly relevant for the research part of this. And uh, the last few years, I've uh, chaired the Global Agenda Council for the World Economic Forum at Davos on the topic of precision health and personalized medicine. And John Wong, who's here from Singapore, is my vice chair. And Jeff's been a great, uh, great colleague in this area. So we tackle this area, mainly because the World Economic Forum is an interesting place. You know, there are many scientific opportunities. You know, if we, I'm going to talk a little about data sharing and global alliance, many others, uh, between academics. 
And there are indeed data sharing opportunities between industry as well for just starting. But I think it's a collective issue about how to pull together health insurance data, academic data, you know, uh, industry data, and uh, research data. Uh, there's been a very difficult issue uh, to begin with. The Work and Work Forum is an uh, assembly of people who are CEOs of industry, a pharma, biotechnology, but also CEO of, of uh, insurance payers, Aetna, Cigna, many others uh, are there. All health systems like me, deliverers, and also state ministers, ministers of health. And this became a really good forum to say, is this a really important issue? And of course, in the context of economy, and health is a big issue. And so the promise of uh, genomic and personalized medicine in impacting society and its impact on economy, obviously, in addition to health, is something that's attracted their attention. So what we decided to tackle, and we have a, uh, the, the agenda council includes Francis Collins, Peggy Hamburg, uh, many other people that you know, uh, Charles Sawyers, et cetera, is to ask the question, what are the things that we can uniquely utilize this forum for the leadership of companies and health system to all agree to go forward, in addition to scientists agreeing among themselves. And so we actually talk on three different arena. One is making the case for personalized and physician medicine. And here we're doing a modeling. It's kind of a mathematical or economic modeling to say that if, uh, if you realize uh, the potential of, say, reducing diabetes uh, by a certain number, or in this case, we're looking at BRCA, et cetera, what is the economic impact? It's really very impressive. We had Dana Goldman, who is the head of the Sanger, uh, pardon me, the uh, Schaefer, Institute and use USC doing this analysis. Second work stream is looking at how to enhance the science, and here we quickly converge at data sharing. I think Dan Roden said earlier about you know the paradox. You need large data sets to get the data. So if you don't data share, you're never going to be able to kind of get the information. So we quickly converge to data sharing, and the question we're asking is how do we do it differently? And uh, and we had many conversation, including the recent one in Abu Dhabi, and a call yesterday in which uh, Francis and others are on it. Where we are converging is to creation of an idea of, in fact, a, a metadata the repository, kind of like an eBay concept. And uh, Jeff can tell you more about this, but a safe deposit box where people can put their stuff there. You can look at it, but if for any transaction, you still own it, but you, in fact, you can figure out a way to share it and to have incentive in sharing this. And I'm sure that we can discuss a little bit more, but it's still very early. I just want to hasten to point out that I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in talking about this. The third area, which Peggy Hamburg leads, is the question of harmonization of regulatory and payment issues. Very important issue. In fact, I'm part of the IOM uh, roundtable, and I hear them you know, on genomic uh, applied to uh, health. And of course, this is always a conversation. And so we are now doing a landscape internationally to look at across all different countries, landscape issues about regulatory issues and potentially payment issues. So that's where we're pulling together. And I think in the steering committee conversation, there could be a lot that one can think about how you guys can work together in this. The other area I'm involved with, uh, and I appreciate Dr. Fad, your comment, is in fact, I'm afraid I'm the person responsible for the genome carta. Uh, together with Alice Suhuni and Lord Aradazi, uh, we're the three senior policy advisors to Her Highness Sheikha Moza. And in fact, uh, she charged me with pulling together the whole idea of personalized medicine in Qatar, which resulted in this declaration of genome Qatar with the idea of sequencing every Qatari. Uh, and of course, they're building a, a, uh, a health delivery system with electronic health record, Biobank IT, so this is going to be a very exciting project going forward. And I thought Tim Hubbard's presentation was particularly intriguing to me of how you organize this and how one actually takes on such a, you know, still sizable project. So again, there's an opportunity to think about learning from each other, and certainly I, uh, I value, I have a team of people with Hal Jacob, one of my students, David Goldstein, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Jeff Ginsburg who helped me 
with at least initial planning of this, working along with the Qatar Foundation and their, uh, their people. So auto, uh, I want to just read you one thing. We did a survey when we began this initiative in the, uh, in the World Economic Forum and asked the leaders in industry, scientists, et cetera, what are the barriers uh, in terms of personalized medicine. And I'll just read the numbers to you. Technical barrier, lack of infrastructure to facilitate data exchange, privacy issues, how to ensure security and privacy, absence of well-defined standards for data elements and data collection. Data is a competitive advantage for owners, so what is, in fact, you know, the barriers for sharing, and of course, the lack of incentive for sharing. And of course, the issue is that the data sharing is constrained to a country on a small network within the country. There are many legal issues. Clearly, that there are things that we should talk about in this context when we have international opportunity to say how can we address these things together moving forward. So that's, that's my introductory remark. So I think Kevin said that his background was far from, from this, co this topic, uh, and I won't even tell you how far my background is from this. Uh, I'm a physiologist from the Kalinske Institute in Stockholm, but I'm here uh, from my perspective for this panel, for this discussion, is from, for that, from that of representing a funding agency. So my name is Mats Ulvendal. I'm representing the Swedish Research Council in Stockholm, where I'm responsible for medicine and health as, as Secretary General. Uh, in Sweden, research funding is very much based on a bottom-up approach which means that it's actually very hard to have centralized programs or thematic programs addressing topics li like genomic medicine. Uh, essentially, the only way that we can get something in a thematic way or a strategic way is to get the government to say that this is an important topic, and they're extremely reluctant to do so, which is very too much of the ple pleasure of the scientific community, which really likes the, the bottom-up approach. But it makes it difficult for, for the international collaboration focusing on specific <coughs> topics. That this doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of research actions or efforts going on with personalized medicine or genomic medicine, but it's not coordinated uh, in any way. Uh, there was a recent uh, report by the European Science Foundation which, which stated that or concluded that, that for, for taking genomic medicine or personalized medicine a step forward, there were national efforts needed. And I think that's extremely important that we get the, the nations or the countries to work together especially since in most countries uh, the, the healthcare system is based on, on, on uh, the, the funding and the, the directives of, of uh, the governments. We have some uh, experience in Europe using a, an instrument, a funding instrument called joint programming, which is between the, the different countries in, in Europe. Uh, this is very powerful or could be a very powerful instrument where we work together to address major societal challenges. However, the experience we have with this working together is that it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of, it requires a lot of co commitment from, from the different countries in order to make this something more than, than talk. And I, I think it's very important for the discussion we'll have now and tomorrow that, that we go beyond the talking and to set up objectives which actually can be addressed and we could be accounted for if we're going to take this a step forward and, and to implement it. I think I'll end there. So, um, well, good afternoon. You've heard a number of sort of major themes that my colleagues here have said, and, and um, I'm really going to emphasize sort of one major theme, but before that, let me give you where I come from. So, uh, you know, I spent the first third of my life in India, growing up in India, in a place like Calcutta, and, and then I've spent the remaining two-thirds in the U.S. They're two very, very different worlds. It's always impressed me that the kind of genetics that we do in one part of the world is often not translated, even when it might be in, in other parts of the world that I still visit. <coughs> and this, in some sense, is personal because it affects, you know, sometimes me when I'm traveling. Being exposed to the Indian healthcare system is a trip in and of itself. Um, <laughs> but um, it affects many of my close relatives. Now, I've actually, I have to say, I've been remarkably <coughs> impressed. I thought I'd come to this meeting. I came fairly jaded and thinking I was going to roll my eyes. But, but it is, it's, uh, it's really impressive to see how much progress has been made from not only the experience of single gene and rare disorders that many of you have commented on, but, but what's really forthcoming. 
So my other perspective is really primarily on the nature of evidence we are going to accept and what we will consider to be causal and a basis for action. And this comes in two ways. Um, you know, most of us as researchers have in our lives gone out and designed and collected a sample. Uh, I can say that almost all of my work, unlike Kevin, has been on the human as a species. So we've gone out, designed, collected, often at great pains, as Victor would know in many, you know, uh, samples. But I think we are very rapidly moving to a very, very different model. I don't think we're going to do very much of that. We will do that in the context of clinical trials. But much of the research that we're going to do are going to be through these large collections, be the national collections or the Vanderbilt system or in Israel. And how we extract meaning from this data or the kinds of biases there may be or the kinds of evidence we would require I think is actually very different. I think Irene brought up the question of statistical significance, but it's not only we need statistical significance. What will we consider as evidence that this gene slash variant is involved in a particular phenotype, what we call actionable? So we are now relying very much on the evidence that's been collected over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And I think we need to spend a lot of effort on the epidemiology of these systems, what it tells us, uh, what you know, are the nature of the patients, and I don't think we should take it for granted that this is a simple and solved problem. And the reason why it's an important problem, that extra dimension is often when we've done studies, you know, we've done a study, for example, say in the UK and done a replication in other, you know, sort of ethnic diversity of populations. But just from what's been presented today, let alone what's to come after this session and tomorrow, we have a huge, huge diversity of political systems, economic and social systems, healthcare systems. I like Rob Califf's um, sort of, you know, quotation that somebody gave, that, that whatever these systems are, there are also questions of genetic diversity. I mean, I think this is the first time you really have an opportunity to figure out what gene and environmental interaction actually might be. I don't think many of, I don't think, I'm sure, I'd like to see data that um, a particular variant has the same effect throughout the globe. And I think these kinds of information is going to become very important. So how we design studies in the face of all of this kind of interactions, some of which are biologic, some of which are not, I think is an extremely important part. And questions of design and analysis, I think, are, are foremost. And I'm going to, so the questions of data sharing that's been brought up, I think is absolutely crucial. Um, I'm going to leave you just with, you know, one maybe, which is a personal plea that uh, I think Jeff or Terry Minolio today morning brought up the issue that I think Jeff did that in trying to do genomic medicine, we should not increase the cost, but rather try to be within. And my other plea is we shouldn't, in fact, uh, increase health disparities either that some group get at the expense of others. So uh, perhaps one of the outcomes that could come from this meeting is perhaps series of case scenarios or examples. Many of the examples that at least I heard of today with genetic or genomic medicine is, you know, taking place are individual examples that people have chosen given their circumstance and their interests and, and, and medical needs. But it may also be helpful to have one or a few examples that cuts across many nations and systems to get some common experience. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name's Anne Colby. And first of all, could I please acknowledge the wisdom of the traditional people on whose lands we are privileged to meet today? And I understand there was a recent landmark decision made in Maryland about that. Congratulations to the state of Maryland. Um, I'd also like to thank Jeff and the team for hosting this meeting, which I do think is a landmark meeting, and thank you for inviting New Zealand. I'm a bit of a philistine in this room, and perhaps you might start to throw tomatoes at me. 
I'm a policy maker. I am not a researcher and I'm not a geneticist. Um, I'm a vocationally registered paediatric surgeon. Um, I continue to practice. I'm a previous president of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, so I've worked on both sides of the Tasman, um, south of the equator. Um, I've held a lot of senior and management roles in healthcare. I have been a director, a member of the board of the New Zealand Pharmaceutical Management Agency, which purchases pharmaceuticals for the New Zealand publicly funded system. I currently chair a brand new business in New Zealand with my six member business board. That board is responsible for prioritising the country's vote health spend. And for us, for 4.3 million people, that's $14 billion. Um, we operate a, under an accountability of reasonableness framework. Um, we are required to operate across four domains, which are clinical safety and effectiveness, ethical and societal issues, including legal and legislative issues, uh, economic issues and feasibility of adoption, which includes infrastructure, workforce, finance, budget impact and affordability. Our minister requires us to be able to implement. Advice is cheap, action is quite expensive and difficult to accomplish in complex systems. He requires us to do that in a flatline funding budget. So we need to be able to understand how to move the money around. The purpose to get measurable, and I underline the word measurable, value for money for New Zealand citizens, which means we have to be able to define the enhanced outcomes across health and disability that our citizens will see, and we need to be able to touch the dark green dollars that are invested to achieve those outcomes in a flatline funding budget. We currently spend about just under 8% of GDP on healthcare in New Zealand, and healthcare in New Zealand has a very significant negative impact on GNP. Um, we have been charged with improving health input into GDP and reducing its negative impact on GNP. As I sit here, I've heard some very interesting words, um, all of which, um, as a person who chairs a board responsible for a very new business that's trying to learn how to crawl in quite a complicated world, have been um, very positive from my point of view. I have heard the word international cooperation used a great deal. I have had heard the word used about transferability and generalizability um, of information and systems from one context to another. And I think that's a really important issue that we should consider as a group. I've heard the words about planning and some of you have spoken very eloquently about end-to-end -end planning from basic research through to actual implementation and delivery and measurement of that and the quality improvement cycle that <coughs> tweaks our systems as we go forward. And I guess I've heard about thinking about the whole of the system um, in trying to pull this together in some coordinated way. If I may indulge you with one very short story before I finish to, um, I guess, highlight the difficulties that one small nation faces. When I was the director of Pharmac, we decided to list allotinib as a third line treatment for non-small cell cancer of the lung, not based on genetic testing. Sensible commercial strategy was then subsequently to split the market by listing gefitinib as first line treatment targeted by genetic testing. Pharmac did that with our knowledge in the National Health Committee and then we had to set about implementing the EGFR testing regime for New Zealand. 
and trying to decide, did we have the right pathologists? And you need two types of pathologists to do this. Where did it sit in the model of care for stage three and four lung cancer? How did you collect the specimens? What sort of specimens? Who was going to collect them? What patient populations would be managed? And we know exactly how many patients we have with this disease in any one year. Would we send the tests overseas or would we, as I love the term, home brew them? Um, how many labs would we ask to do them? What would be the turnaround times? Now, when you run the economic modelling over that, you get vast variation. And the vast variation is heavily fed by what the mutation rate is in your local population. We don't know the mutation rate and the RCTs were largely done in Asia. And we're not quite sure how to transfer that. So we have no idea whether this test is cost effective. Now put that beside the cutting edge research in respiratory medicine that's been done in lung cancer in New Zealand, which shows us that in our own environment, we have one of the worst records in the world of diagnosing people with stage <coughs> one and two disease. Why is that? And one might well say, perhaps we should move the money from TKIs, it's a top spend for Pharmac in the public system, and put it into trying to identify the patients much earlier. And maybe there are, I'm not a geneticist, maybe there are some things that you can all help us with that would improve that system of care. So the thing that I have been asked to do by the government is to get proper end-to-end -end models of care and decide which technologies best get value for money when applied to that model of care. And quite frankly, we need all the help we can get from many of you who sit in this room who understand the science <coughs> and how we can best apply it. But your research is only as good as how we get to apply it to the patients that we're responsible and privileged to treat every day. Thanks, all of you. Um, at this point, uh, and really a, tr a tremendous diversity of, of, uh, of experiences and opinions um, on where this field uh, can and should go, um, I want to encourage uh, a uh, you to react to one another's statements if you if you wish, but also um, the audience to uh, begin to ask some provocative questions that will get us down the road. Mark. Yeah, so uh, Mark Williams Geisinger, uh, health system. I wanted. To, I, I love that uh, story because it's it's something that we deal with all the time, which is where's the best allocation of resources. And in some sense, I have a certain amount of embarrassment getting out of bed every morning as a genomic medicine person and saying, "Gosh, we got to go to it," because I know that if we put the same amount of money into truly improving our systems of care, we could have a much larger impact, uh, probably in a very short period of time. And so we, I think we have to recognize that um, uh, we have that dilemma. So the, the question uh, or the point that you made that I think is really relevant and I'd like to hear the group talk about because I think it's something that is critically important for all of us that are in the space of uh, research and implementation is that it's not only about developing evidence, but it's developing the right kind of evidence to answer the questions that are really important for the healthcare system. And while we've had some attempts within the Genomic Medicine Working Group to engage with stakeholders from the payer community and from uh, government healthcare systems and, and other representatives, I don't think that we have clearly identified a way to match the questions that are going to be of most importance uh, uh, to the research and implementation that we want to do. So I'd be really interested in hearing ideas about how we might be able to do that. Well, I'll start if you want, <laughs> because um, it was a question that our minister, the Honorable Tony Ryle, asked me when he set up the NHC. So. And admittedly, this is easier to do in, in a confined system like New Zealand, where most of the resource is publicly funded. So what the NHC management and scientific team has started to do is to build a program budget across the whole of healthcare. 
and that program budget is currently based on disease states, big picture disease states like cardiovascular disease. So we now understand what we spend in secondary care, what we spend in farms, what we spend in diagnostics, and we can clump it up by disease states. And then we can explode those disease states and say, what do we spend on lung cancer? What do we spend on chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease? Um, someone, and we can put that on a grid chart. Someone showed a beautiful grid chart today of um, disease versus survival, as I remember, which is a similar thing. And that starts to give you, and I'd love to put those two things together, that starts to give you a little bit of a roadmap saying, here are your problem areas. So let's invest in that. And that also starts to give information to industry and information to researchers about how we develop things that hopefully slowly we can pull being fit for purpose into business as usual, which is the aim of an overarching health technology assessment agency that has responsibility for a notional budget. So that's our embryonic start to answering your questions. Thanks. Does anybody else want to address that? And I, my, one comment I'll make um, is that um, <clears throat> it seems like what you're, what you're recommending is we start um, with what, my, what some might call is the unmet medical need, um, which is where actually industry also is motivated to fill that gap um, with therapeutics. But I would say um, the genomics community doesn't necessarily function that way. It's been more built from the bottom up of the base of research that we've you know, all um, uh, used and experienced, but uh, we haven't said uh, to policymakers like yourself or health system uh, CEOs like Victor, uh, you know, what's really uh, causing you the most, uh, what's causing you to lose sleep at night that we can potentially address um, using these new technologies and work from, from that problem back to what science is needed to address those problems. Is that a reasonable way to frame your answer a little bit more? Um, so this, this question of the economics, the, the way you're presenting it, it sounds a bit like companion diagnostics um, in terms of economic analysis. Now, of course, that's for cancer, but a lot of these things, if it's germline, then the, you know, the way you know, the Genomics England strategy, of course, is rare disease and cancers as particular areas. But if you can get the infrastructure in place and you do the whole genome and you store it, then that's a one-off cost. And then everything else, all the subsequent use of algorithms to check that for any, any future thing through the lifetime is essentially almost free. It's, you know, it's, and it's instant. There's no waiting around for a diagnostic decision either. And so the economics changes completely. You can't really, you, or you've, or you've got to sum the economic impact across a person's life and a pers all the possible diseases. And you know, the hope is, of course, that that will turn out to be much cheaper than all these different tests, but it changes these business models which are based around diagnostic testing. Three years. Um, I'd like to just follow up on Irene's comment about taking advantage of existing structures. Uh, I'm the chair of the executive committee of IRDIC, and IRDIC in particular has come up a few times already in, in discussions today. Um, there are several people in the room who are also involved with IRDIC, and I thought, with permission, I just take a, it's the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. Uh, there clearly is some overlapping, there are overlapping discussions within IRDIC and some of what we're talking about today, at least in the rare disease space. So I thought I would just take a minute to explain what that organization is. Um, IRDIC has two central goals, which is to catalyze development of diagnostics for essentially all rare diseases, um, but also to develop 200 new therapies for rare disease by the end of the decade. So it's clearly about translational research. It's not just a discovery research consortium. Uh, by therapies, we don't mean things that work in a mouse. Uh, we mean FDA or EMA approved uh, new treatments. Uh, there are three scientific committees. One deals with diagnostics, one deals with therapeutics, but there also is an interdisciplinary committee that deals with ethical, legal, social, economic issues that pertain to genetic testing and uh, 
clinical exome sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. And these are some discussions that have appeared in a lot of people's talks. IRDIC involves over 30 funders. Uh, collectively, they've pledged well over a billion dollars toward the research goals of the organization. Uh, many of them are public sector funders, but many of them are also private sector funders. There are two big pharmas, uh, Shire and Genzyme are both members, and there are several biotech companies uh, active in that area who are also active in IRDIC. IRDIC also involves patient organizations, again, which points out this is about translational research, this is about uh, helping people with disease. Um, and finally, I just want to say there's a lot of overlap between IRDIC and the Global Alliance. Um, both organizations are dealing with facilitating standardization of data, harmonization of data, facilitating data transfer, uh, dealing with streamlining consent, consent procedures and the like to facilitate better data transfer. And there are people, uh, individual scientists, who are actually active in both organizations at the same time. So I, I just wanted to, I thought, to, since IRDA keeps coming up, I thought it would be appropriate to say a bit more about it. And I can answer questions about it as the meeting progresses. Thanks. Does anybody like to make a comment about IRDIC, Irene? Yeah, I, I could add on to that, that also in the context of IRDIC, we have started to support uh, what we would call clinical bioinformatics, uh, where we put together the sequencing data together with the clinical data as sort of an embryo to build further on as well in, in, into that sphere. Got it. Hi. Um, I have two comments or questions. One regarding the, everybody says data sharing and, you know, large databases, et cetera. Being involved in quite a lot of these consortia activities, the issue of harmonization of data coming from different uh, places is a major, major, major issue. It's not simply just that we have the freedom that everybody, you know, will just take his data set and put it in a common domain. It really is very hard, and especially if uh, groups come from different backgrounds, okay? And we ran into very funny situations when people were trying to analyze databases that they were not familiar with, okay? So, you know, in nutrition and this and that, they differ so much around the world that really, to, I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy statement to share data, but, uh, you know, I, I believe that just sharing the genetic test result is hard enough to get harmonization there, and there the rules are clear. But to, to share uh, follow-up data with follow-up methods and, and, and the whole way of collecting background data could be a disaster. I mean, again, we are, we are trying to work on minimal databases in a variety of consortia, Gecko, Correct, other Simba, but it's, it's quite painful. So I'm just warning. Uh, from, you know, using this term very often. But the other issue that I, I really want to, so to see. Yes, please. And your, your prescription is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're on stage, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, you are an extremely smart gentleman, but, um, <laughs> but, but uh, so I would say that at least from the point of view of epidemiology, uh, and including in genetics, I think there is now quite a bit of evidence as to what harmonization takes. It's not perfect, uh, but I think uh, many of the reasons why there are credible results for any of these GWAS results uh, has come from fairly difficult, you know, harmonization methods. So I, I think. I would say that the prescription is to improve the criteria for harmonization of phenotypes. You, you have to do this. Otherwise, I think um, just standardizing sequence level data is going to be insufficient. Yeah. And maybe prospectively try to put some ground rules as what data to collect. Well, well that's why I, you know, I, I wasn't yeah. giving strong suggestions that yeah. one of the things is to do one, maybe a few projects that cuts across various sources just to see yeah. where the actual problems lie. Okay, so my second wait, wait, question wait, wait. in a Hang sense is second. to the same thing. I oh, sorry. So let uh, some of the other panelists respond as well, Victor and then Kevin. Well, I, you know, I don't think we're naive about this. Anybody who walks into this knows the long list of problems. So I think really the issue is, as you said, what we can do about this. And you have to put on the table for such discussion, right? 
And obviously, I hope that through the efforts in terms of at least trying to put the data together, you begin to develop those harmonization standards. Importantly, I was very interested in th listening to Tim Hubbard because, you know, uh, for forgetting your phenotype, what you put in electronic health record is going to be really interesting aside from interoperability is the information they can derive from it. And you've done a lot of analysis how difficult it is. So we're not naive about this by all means. But it is the big issue to tackle, isn't it? Right. Yep. So the, the second question I want to throw back again is with these four different organizations, do you have to harmonize the ethics and consenting rules? Do they all have the same consenting systems? Because I can imagine this is also going to be a major yeah. effort. Yeah, pretty much so. Well, in Israel, by chance, we have a national genetics IRB committee. So every individual IRB committee of any institute has to be approved. The, the decision of it has to be approved by a national group, which we think is a pain. But, uh, <laughs> but maybe bring some more harmonization of that side of things. My second question is really, uh, in a sense, a little more practical. Uh, uh, we, we were... Uh, historically, in the field of screening, etc., because it always uh, uh, required huge groups uh, to be studied on a population base, uh, what developed in the 70s was a whole line of demonstration projects. Now, we, he, a lot of people here have raised the issue of getting evidence and then the hardship of getting evidence in a field where you're actually working on individualized results. Okay, and it's really very tough and, and, and hard to. The question is, do you see any agencies and the people here from the uh, you know, NIH and from the EU and all that, do you see any way for demonstration projects to be fundable on these issues? Because usually if you, I mean, th these are projects that scientific organs don't like. So I will start on that one. So um, we actually have a call open uh, where we invite actually for pilot projects in rolling out genomic medicine or personalized medicine um, into the healthcare to actually build the evidence. Uh, we have in Europe a couple of, of models and I think the best model we have for time being is in France since the French National Cancer Institute. Um, I don't know if Professor Sirota is gonna present that tomorrow. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes he is, uh, which I think uh, at least at European level is uh, by far the best model that we have, that you have a, a pan-national um, molecular testing for all cancer patients and the system set up with pathologists, et cetera. I don't want to go ahead, but I think that's, that's really fantastic. There are also other, we have heard Estonia there. I know there are activities going on in the Czech Republic and also at regional levels you have hospitals. Um, in Germany, for example, who are implementing sort of this at, at the local level, so to say. So I think what we also would need is a much better mapping of all the different pilots going on. Uh, but we are definitely willing to go in and fund pilots and also including health insurers and the whole sort of system, because I think that's one of the very important points in, in driving this area forward, is actually to work to, with the payers um, in to getting the right questions answered when you set up those pilots. Uh, otherwise, that would be a waste of money as well. So we really need to think carefully when we go forward into those areas. Um, I wanted to also to make the comment about the importance of ontologies. And again, coming to the area of rare diseases, a lot of work has been done in terms of harmonizing ontologies. And I think that's something that before we go in to talk about harmonization of electronic health records, etc., we should think about you know, the ontology side of that and to, to harmonize that before we go in to start to share because otherwise, again, it's going to be a lost opportunity if we can't understand what we mean between the different regions and different groupings. Are those, I mean, the ontologies that you're harmonizing, are those then publicly available to citizens? How is that being distributed? Yes, that can be publicly available. Heidi? 
So I wanted to build off of this same topic of data sharing. Um, we've been working in creating centralized resources for data sharing. And one of the barriers that we've come across is international laws prohibiting patient data going outside of different countries. And we've hit this in a number of places. So I wonder if anybody, you know, either on the panel or in the audience that is in a country where, where laws prohibit, you know, sharing data outside the boundaries of the country and how you see that going forward. Will that continue to be a barrier? Are there ways to get around this? How can we all, you know, work towards true international data sharing? Anybody who on the panel? I could just mention at European level, we have a new data protection regulation on the table um, for discussion and agreement by the member states. Uh, it's not an easy piece um, to discuss about and the European Parliament has been very restrictive in terms of research use. Um, the Commission, we are very much trying to defend the point of to protect uh, the, uh, the use for research and we hope that the member states are going to help us to, to go into that but uh, it, it's really in the hands of the member states for time being and we hope that we will have a positive outcome. Um, as for the rest of the world, I hope other panelists can. Tim, um, I don't. Th I don't think that you're going to get around these barriers. And the reasonable alternative is is to not move it around, but federate the querying over it. And I think that that is technically difficult, but potentially feasible. And that would not break privacy, but would still like allow aggregate data you know to be extracted but that's a technical thing then maybe the global alliance can implement that kind of technical infrastructure that's kind of what's being discussed yeah. now yeah. Was it Vic or Raju that mentioned the, the metadata repository yes that, that would fit in nicely with that with that construct as well yeah just one, one comment to this huge problem of data sharing I think the whole spirit of this meeting is and, and there might be an answer it's pilots if you go for pilots, you can keep it small and thereby use it as a test ground. So I think it's very important to in today and tomorrow to choose the right pilots. If we could only do one, which one would it be? If we can do five, which ones would it be? So we don't do pilots just because some of us happen to be able to do them, and we look for the lost key under the lamp just because the lamp is there. Thank you, nice point. Does anybody want to react to that? Go ahead. Well, I, I think pilots are very good, and I think that's a very good idea, but I, I think also the, it has to be discussed why do the pilots? Um, I mean, I, and since my background is not in the field, I, I can allow myself to, to ask a stupid question here. And, and implementation, which is the title of the, this panel discussion, is that a research or scientific problem, or is it a political problem? Uh, and look at from, from a national point of view and as a funding agency, I see it's quite much as a, as a political problem. Uh, if we're going to implement genomic medicine, we have to demonstrate that it's, uh, it's a cost benefit into doing it. And we also have to discuss the, the ethical problems which are related to this. Before that has been solved, I don't think any nation will, will, will promote genomic medicine in, in, and put money on that. Patrick? Well, demonstrate cost benefit, but also expose the political landscapes that challenge them. So I don't see them as a, you know, there's a science and a, s and a policy piece to this. Do you want to react to that? I, I would say we talk a lot about um, cost benefit in terms of economic value, but we shouldn't forget the patient benefits as well. Uh, because that's, I mean, it may be more expensive, but the patient outcomes may be far, far better than <coughs> what we had before. Patrick? Yeah, it's one in, in, in the spirit of um, international collaboration, I think, well, one thing that we definitely need is some sort of a standardized set of reference samples that people agree on that could be sequenced in different laboratories and cross compare the results from one and another. And certainly for some of the cancer genome sequencing, there's actually tremendous variations in the sequencing quality. So I think one, th one thing that would be useful is uh, I think maybe for this community to decide on uh, you know, sort of like 10 genomes 
or certain tumor genomes with spike in c- c- controls and we can, wow, we can call different types of allele frequencies confidently in different centers all over the world. Because I really don't think that there is that set of reference samples that can be uniformly distributed towards all of these labs that want to do pretty much the same sort of technology. So I'm just, w- w- I'm just sort of throwing that out to see if, uh, I mean, that could be one basis for one of these pilots for implementation. Pick up the sure. There are a number Spring. of efforts um, already underway to create reference samples that are being distributed in the U.S. Or for laboratories. So, so we would like to know about those, and then but we could actually and may uh, maybe the point the though there. is that it shouldn't be just U.S. centric, given the amount of diversity we've even heard about today, and we undoubtedly will hear about more um, across these different nations. Like so. Sorry, uh, cancer genomes are a somewhat different problem, meaning in, in the sense of how much sequencing you need to discover at what level. Dr. Majumber and then Dr. Almula. Me? Yes. Well, the, actually, every one of us, we know that what is important. Uh, all of us, we may know that delivery of affordable health care so I was thinking from that point of view along with the other issues. And the delivery models are of course, they vary from place to place, country to country. I was thinking actually uh, what could be the future mod- model. Uh, it could be for certain diseases, a model is different. For certain diseases, the model could be different. Uh, maybe uh, unless we come out with such kind of, uh, uh, some kind of a white paper recommendations, it is extremely important how do we deliver such things. Thank you. 